let's uh, get, let's get started. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, uh, you know uh, I'm once again for those of you who don't know who I am. I'm Nabi Seshadri, professor of practice here in the EC department. Uh, this quarter, I have organized a seminar series covering the broad areas of, in a very loose sense, you know, the, the seminar series is communication theory and networking and systems, but uh, it's a very, very broad, I've taken liberty of really giving the students and others a very, very broad exposure to industry practice that affects our daily life, everything from, uh, you know, uh, video streaming to various uh, uh, communications access technologies to uh, storage to uh, cloud networking, uh, hopefully, uh, networking the cloud. So hopefully, you know, uh, most of you are finding it very interesting. Um, and uh, uh, today, it is a, a great privilege for me to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Frank uh, Van Deglen. Uh, uh, I actually met Frank for the first time in 2005. I still remember uh, it was February of 2005. Uh, he was with the associated with a small company. I was CTO at Broadcom, uh, and I was beginning to look for how do how does Broadcom get into location technologies, and I visited his company. and uh, uh, Frank gave a, a fantastic presentation of everything they were doing. Uh, uh, that uh, I at that point of time basically concluded this is the company we need to acquire. Uh, Broadcom subsequently did due diligence for nearly one and a half years of probably 10 other companies in the GPS space. Ultimately, we acquired uh, Global Locate, which uh, uh, you were a co-founder of, Frank, um, uh, or I don't remember whether you were a co-founder. Early, one of the early, one of the early guys. And uh, uh, he's uh, uh, really is a guru of uh, uh, location technologies, and I've heard many, many wonderful talks, and I cannot think of anyone better. In the space, he has written a book on AGPS, uh, and um, uh, also teaches a course quite regularly at Stanford on this topic, uh, and has uh, won some major awards, including, if I recall, one of the most important uh, medals of the Institute of Navigation. Uh, so, uh, without further uh, delay, let's uh, uh, enjoy his talk. So, welcome. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Nambi, and th thank you for inviting me here. It's a real honor to come and speak at UCSD. Uh, it's my first time speaking here, uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, so we, we're going to be talking uh, about wireless location today, and uh, the, the, the reason for that, the reason that I want to come and talk to you about it is because this is really the most exciting time yet for location technology, because for the first time, we have the capability to get high accuracy, meaning sub-meter accuracy for location, indoors and outdoors, in phones. So those three things together, indoors, outdoors, in phones with a, uh, with a high accuracy, has not happened yet because the technology has not been there. And it is here now. And so I, I want to be able to give you a sneak preview of how this is going to become commonplace. Uh, so I'm going to show you recent changes in hardware and in standards that make one meter location possible. And uh, in, in some cases, this is possible in applications as soon as this year. Uh, and I'll give you an overview of, of how that is. So we'll look at Wi-Fi round trip timing technology and standards and Wi-Fi APIs that give you access to these measurements. And at, we'll also talk about new GPS technology and the APIs that give you access uh, to the GPS measurements in Android devices. So we'll be about half the talk will be about Wi-Fi, and which is predominantly for indoor location, and the other half of the talk will be about GPS, which is predominantly for outdoor location. Uh, oh, now my clicker is not working anymore. Well, keyboard. Hmm. Sorry. Stop and start again. Okay. 
so, so as I mentioned, uh, the, the technology, the hardware, and the standards, and Android APIs have all been evolving together to enable us to get location accuracy that was not previously possible in phones. And eventually, like, i.e. In a, in a matter of a few years, like two to three years, this will be available to anyone. So if you just wait around, you'll see location accuracy get much, more, get much better in your phone. But the, you know, the point of doing talks, particularly uh, at an academic institution like this, is to take you under the hood of what's coming and show you what's actually available today and how you or your colleagues or, or people you might advise can take advantage of this right now to get a head start on the future. And so I did want to mention, by the way, that you might be thinking, well, location, is that communications? This is a communication series. And we're talking about wireless location here. And yes, it is indeed uh, based, it is an application of communications, a very specific application, because all, all of high accuracy wireless location is based on communicating some very specific data, namely the time at the transmitter. Transmitter might be a Wi-Fi access point, it might be a satellite, GPS satellite in the sky, but in either case, you're, you're communicating a small amount of data that encodes the time that, in, in some notion of time, at the transmitter, and we'll go through that a little bit, uh, what we mean by that, but doing it in a very, very precise way. What do I mean by precise? I mean measuring time to nanoseconds or picoseconds so that you can get location down to uh, one foot accuracy and better. So where are we today? Uh, let's start with indoor location. If, if you've used indoor location, like in a shopping mall, if you've brought up a map and looked at your blue dot, you may have noticed that a few years ago it would tell you approximately which shopping mall you were in and, and uh, a couple of years ago maybe it showed you which area of the shopping mall you were in and lately it might actually show you which shop you're in. I don't know if any of you have noticed that, but if you, if you think you've noticed, I see some people nodding, which is great. If, if you think you've noticed that things seem to have been getting better, you're not imagining it. Things really ha these are actual test results. We've taken off the, the, the scale on the y-axis, but it is a linear scale, and I'm going to tell you that RTT is a meter accuracy, so you can figure it out backwards if you want to. Uh, that, those are the measured accuracy results that we've got from our own tests over the years, and this is showing you what indoor Wi-Fi-based location accuracy has been like uh, over the last uh, four or so years. And so we're getting to decent accuracy, but it's round trip timing, RTT, that really takes us down to the one meter accuracy level. And that's the, inter that's the really interesting area, obviously. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So that's indoor location with Wi-Fi. What about outdoors with GPS? Well, over the same time scale, nothing much has happened. Uh, back in 2015, if you took a phone and went outside, you'd notice that your accuracy was about five meters. Uh, in fact, I, I did a, a Coursera class that, uh, where we, we had people all around the world, where over a thousand people do an experiment on the same day, where they went out and looked for a place that was visible uh, on Google Maps, uh, so they could see where they were on the satellite view and go stand at that place and see where the blue dot was and then actually figure out for themselves how accurate it was, submit all the data, and the median accuracy throughout the world with phones came out to be 4.9 meters, which was good because we'd all been saying five meters in the industry for years. We didn't really know, and it really is. Uh, so that's what it's been like, and you can do that experiment yourself and see that you get it. If you're, if you're out in the open sky, away from buildings, because the buildings mess things up, if you're away from buildings, you'll get about five meter accuracy, and that hasn't changed over years. Uh, however, what has changed in the last year is that raw GPS measurements, the fundamental measurements themselves, have become available on Android platforms, so Android phones or tablets or whatever, even uh, Android Auto. And you can get those raw measurements and you can do things with them, and I'm going to show you a little bit of what you can do with them today. Okay, so you're all familiar with the blue dot on the map, but to get that blue dot, you need a location provider, and so uh, I'll be talking about the Fuse Location Provider, which is uh, Android's provider that, that merges all the different sources of location, Wi-Fi, GPS, and so on. So you need a location provider, and the location provider has to get measurements from somewhere, and it's going to be measuring range from something. And so today we'll talk about ranging from Wi-Fi and ranging from GPS. And in particular with GPS, I'm going to be talking about carrier phase measurements. And we'll be... so. Uh, uh, I believe most of you are uh, studying uh, wireless communications, and so along the way, you'll see things that overlap with your area of expertise. So in, in particular with GPS, 
the way data is carried is uh, with BPSK system on a, on a carrier wave. And we, uh, with, with these raw measurements, you can actually make measurements on the carrier phase to great precision. I'll, I'll show you that in a few slides' time. Uh, okay. So a little bit about, well, why would you want better location accuracy anyway? Before we jump into how you get good location accuracy, why would you want it in the first place? Well, I'm going to look at just two instances, and at the end of the talk, we'll, I'll, I'll give you some other ideas about applications, and I'm sure you, along the way, will, will think of some if you haven't already thought of some good applications already. So for indoor routing, if you want to do something like navigate to a conference room, there you definitely need better accuracy than you currently get. And wh one of the reasons is if, you, if you're going to have an app that navigates you along a route, like uh, as is shown there, kind of like you're used to doing in your cars, you need much better accuracy indoors then you get outdoors because outdoors GPS could be good to about 10 meters and you'll still find your way to wherever you're going because the roads are more, typically more than 10 meters apart. But indoors, the features are often just a couple of meters apart. You'll have doors a couple of meters from each other, different aisles, cubes really close together. Uh, and so you need around about one meter accuracy. That's really necessary condition to, to make indoor location work. Now, Outdoors, why would you need better accuracy than outdoors? I just told you that you can navigate uh, on the streets with about 5 to 10 meter accuracy. And so what, what is there to do? Well, well, outdoors, as you know, I'm sure you've all navigated with, with Google Maps. I hope you do. Uh, and w one of the things Google Maps does really nicely is to give you a route based on traffic conditions. But it's based on the average speed of the traffic on the road. And really, you don't want the average speed of traffic on the road. You want the speed of traffic in the lane that you're in. So you like it to answer questions like, if I take the carpool lane, how much better will it be? And then conversely, often exit roads, particularly in NorCal, where I'm from, exit roads might be really blocked up. And, and at the moment, the mapping apps don't really understand that. And often maybe what they should have done is tell you to go beyond the exit you want and then loop back instead of sitting in a slow exit lane. So, well, what do you need? You need lane level accuracy. And to get that, you need about a meter accuracy from the GPS. So there's just one example of why you would need something more than what you currently get. Now, of course, there's hundreds of other examples, and the whole point of the open Android ecosystem is that you can think of better examples than we can, and so that's the whole idea of Android, that we want to make measurements available to everybody and, and have you do smarter things than we can do. Okay, so now let's look at the actual positioning technology for the next 20 minutes or so uh, of Wi-Fi, and particularly uh, Wi-Fi round-trip time, and which is going to give us about one meter accuracy indoors. OK, so before describing the technology, I just let's hit the ground running with a cool video to show you it working. So I'm going to show you an app. I want to emphasize this is not a product that you can get. This is an internal app that we developed just to, just to test that it actually works. Uh, so what this will show you is the app that generated the picture I showed you a minute ago. Uh, of somebody navigating from somewhere to somewhere else inside a Google office and, and to, to show you what kind of accuracy we're getting from Wi-Fi RTT. Okay, so what you're going to see here is somebody just, just analogous to being in the street and navigating from point A to point B. They're going to start in one conference room and look for another conference room called TEPU, T-E-P-U, that's the name of the room, and then navigate to there. So they... They find the room, they say navigate. This is all at 5x speed, so you don't get bored. And it generates a route, and now the person's, as they walk, the gray dot shows you the Wi-Fi position, and the blue dot shows you the closest spot on the route. Now they're going to deliberately deviate from the route just to generate a reroute, so the app will reroute them. And so you can kind of see, you can see the gray dot independent of the route, and now they'll follow the routes. And so now you can see the accuracy. The accuracy is the difference between the gray and the blue dot. And it's one to two meter accurate, and you can see why you need that two meter accuracy, else you'll be in the next row over. And I don't know if you noticed, but as it, at, the right, at the end there, they, they made it to the conference room. So that's, that's an example of the kind of thing that, the kind of app that you can enable. It's also a, an illustration of why you need this very high accuracy, that e even at one to two meters, which is something like 10x better than you can get today, it, it's, it's good enough, but only just good enough. You couldn't get much worse than that, and you'd start to be in the wrong aisle. OK, so I'm going to describe uh, round-trip timing, how it works, and how you can access the data. Uh, but before describing it in detail, I want to give you a brief description of how Wi-Fi location works today 
in your phones. So the way it works is that the only signal that we have access to, the wireless signal, is the received signal strength indication, the name called RSSI. So, so in the phones, you can scan for access points and you can get a measure of the received signal strength of the access points. And that gives you a rough indication of how close you are to the access point, because of course the received signal strength uh, decays at uh, uh, the square of the distance. And so roughly in circles around an access point, the, the signal will decay. And this is giving you an, an idea of a measured signal strength at different locations. That's the heat map. So green is strong, red is weak. But what you can see, it's not exactly circular because you, you've got signal, you've got multipath, you, you've, you've got the effect of the buildings. And in what's, what's most important is that you've got the effect of your own body. So this is one of the main limitations of received signal strength. If I'm standing here, this, uh, I think that's an access point right there. I'll have a certain signal strength to that. But if I turn around, the signal will drop about 15 dB because it's coming through the salt water of my body. And if you're just doing ranging based off signal strength, that'll be as if I'd moved far away. And, and so that's the limit on the indoor accuracy that we get today uh, with RSSI. And so we want something better than that. And the better is uh, time of flight, namely round trip time. So what round trip time does is use time of flight instead of signal strength to get a range. And, so, and specifically, it measures the time for a Wi-Fi packet to travel from the access point to the phone, and then the phone will turn around and send it back. So it's hence round trip time. And it's a radio signal, so the time of flight is this, at the speed of light, and you can measure the distance. So as you all know, and you've known forever, speed of light is constant in all reference frames, but maybe you never asked yourself, why is the speed of light constant? And this is the reason. So we can measure distance accurately in our phones. Okay, and so, okay, you measure tw twice the time of flight, divide by two, you have the distance. Okay, and how, how do you actually do that? Well, I'll get to that. If, if you've got the distance to a bunch of access points and you know where the access points are, well, you can solve for your location. It's, it's a multivariable equation with two unknowns, X and Y. Uh, there's many simple ways to do that. I'll show you one of the simplest and most elegant in a minute. Uh, but I just want to go through uh, the steps that have happened to make this available and why we're talking about RTT this year and not last year or the year before or next year. And the reason is that so this year is really the year of Wi-Fi RTT in Android because what has happened is we've released, uh, let me get my pointer here, uh, we've re released an API that gives you access to the round trip time measurements which are defined in 802.11mc. So I know two weeks ago you had Venko from Broadcom, uh, ex-colleague of Nambies and Mind, talking to you about 802.11az, which is the latest standard. Uh, but back in 2016, 802.11mc standard was ratified, and that included so-called fine time measurements, which is what you need for round trip time. The Wi-Fi Alliance interop program was defined in 2017, so that allows people to test uh, device A against device B, make sure that it works. We've been doing a lot of that uh, through 2017. I'll show you a little example of that. And then this year, we've released uh, an API to give access to the measurements in the latest release of Android, which is known as Android P. That's the latest release of the OS. Okay, so that's the, the history of it. And then this is a little simple diagram to show you how it works. So it's, it's new, but it's really quite simple. So first of all, the phone finds all RTT-capable access points through a Wi-Fi scan. So it'll scan, it'll get the responses, and it'll, it'll learn in a way, I'll show you in a minute, which of these access points is RTT capable, i.e. which of the ones have implemented the standard and been through the uh, Wi-Fi Alliance uh, interop test. So it has that list, and then it, it make a request to a particular one of those access points uh, for a fine time measurement. So you'll see that at the top. So the phone says, fine time measurement request. Uh, the access point says, okay, and we'll then begin a ping pong protocol where the, it'll send a, what's a so-called FTM measurement, a fine time measurement, and it will, look, it will note the time that it sent it according to its clock. The, the phone will pick it up and it will note the time that it received it, it'll send it off, it'll also note the time that it sent it, T3, and the access point will note the time that it arrived, and so now the total, run to, the total time, the elapsed time is T4 minus T1, and the turnaround time in the phone will be several microseconds here. 
two to three, which is thousands of times longer than the time of flight, which will just be a few nanoseconds. Uh, speed of light is one foot in one nanosecond. That's why we have feet. Uh, so uh, you'll have a few nanoseconds there, like maybe 100 nanoseconds. You may uh, maybe have 100 microseconds there. So the total time is dominated by this time, the t3 minus t2. Luckily, you know that. So what the, the, then the last step is that the access point communicates to you what is t1 and t4. And so now you just t4 minus t1 is the total time. Subtract out the turnaround time. That's your time of flight. So that's nice and simple. But the beauty of that little equation is that in doing this t4 minus t1, whatever clock bias you had of this, the clock offset, because these things are not synchronized. So this is running a clock. This is running a clock. It doesn't matter how asynchronous they are with each other, because t4 minus t1 cancels any bias in there, and t3 minus t2 cancels any bias in there. So this gives you an accurate time of flight measurement independent of clock synchronization between the, the phone and the access point. So it's, it's just subtraction, but it's kind of a nice little trick. OK. Uh, so that's what happens. And in fact, th that's the basic description. In practice, what happens is that the protocol allows for a burst of measurements. So, so find time measurement and, act, and a repeat, 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 repeat. Uh, the protocol, the way we implement it in Android is typically we'll do eight repeats. And why do we do that? Well, we can average the round trip time with the eight. We can get improvement in accuracy. Plus, we can work out some statistics. So we can work out uh, the variance or the standard deviation of the measurement. Uh, and we can also, we also take note of how many of these succeeded, because sometimes there'll be, uh, m maybe we won't get that information, because this is data being communicated. If we don't get the data, some of these will fail. And so that's useful information, how many of the eight succeeded. So that information will be communicated uh, to, the ac to the phone as well. Okay, so now let's get to a little bit of the geometry about, so now you've made a distance measurement, well, what do you do with it? Well, obviously, if you have a range, from a known point for the moment, let's assume the point, those axis points are at known points. So x1, y1 is the known point of the axis point. You've got some range, well, you're on a circle. If you're dealing in two dimensions, and for the purpose of this talk, I'm talking about two dimensions, horizontal x, y, well, is the equation of a circle. So you get a few of those, uh, and well, it's, if, suppose we had four, four equations, two unknowns, you could solve that in many ways. Visually, what are you doing? You're finding the intersection of all of those circles. But programmatically to solve that, it's a little bit of a pain. Uh, and so a nice little trick to do it is just you can subtract pairs. So I can subtract, uh, so if we look at, at the top one, so x1, y1 is known, and that's the, that's the location of the axis point. xy is the unknown, your location. So xy here is the same unknown. Well, if you multiply that out, you're going to have an x squared on the top. You've got the same x squared there. If you subtract those two, you get rid of the x squareds, you get rid of the y squareds, you're left with linear terms. So it's the equation of a line. So pairs of circles turn into lines, hence these lines here, and the intersection of those lines is the same as the intersection of the circle. So it's, and it's pretty easy to program, find the intersection of the line. But more importantly is that in real life, it's not pretty like that with circles completely intersecting. You've got errors in there. And so exaggerating a little bit, it might look like this, where there's no intersection for some of those circles. Now, if you just, if you'd code it up, if you'd gone to the trouble of coding up intersection of circles, well, what do you do now? Well, if you do the line trick, well, now you have lines intersecting, in this case, in a triangle. Well, it turns out you, you just do the, the you, you, you're solving for the intersection of those lines. You do the least square solution to a set of linear equations, which you probably all learned in first year, if not in high school, being people who got into San Diego, UCSD. Uh, and it turns out the, the least square solution is the maximum likelihood solution given uh, some assumptions on the errors. And so there you go. Simple as that. So the, the geometric part of it is, is fairly easy and straightforward. And I just thought it's nice to go through that just to show like, how you end up, how do you actually get to a position. OK, so uh, now let's talk about some of the challenges. I mentioned before that before this could, you, you, you look back in 2016, 802.11mc uh, standard was passed. You think, well, why, why wasn't I giving you this talk in 2016? Well, a whole lot of stuff has to happen before things become reality. One of the biggest things is that a phone that's got a chip from Qualcomm inside maybe is for sure going to do RTT pretty nicely to an access point that's also got a Qualcomm chip, but it better work with every other access point, like a Broadcom chip or a MediaTek chip or something like that. So there's all this interoperability testing that has to be done. And uh, multipath is a big issue because you're going to get reflections of those things. And so how do the different uh, 
algorithms that do this round trip timing in the first place, do they treat multipath in a consistent way, so in a way that you, you don't get too much of a bias in the measurements? Well, how do you know that? Well, one of the things we do at Google is we test a bunch of things. This is, this is showing you a robot doing the test. So what it's doing there, it's got a phone of a particular kind on it, and it's driving back and forth over those lines, and it recognizes each time it crosses uh, one of those white stripes, and they're a meter apart, so, and it knows what it should measure at each point, and it collects the statistics. And then we can go and give feedback to the different uh, people, the different partners in, at different places in the ecosystem, and say, hey, we noticed that your access point works great with your chip in the phone, but it really works badly with someone else, and, and that's one of the things we do at, in, within Android, is try and make the ecosystem uh, work. And, and so that's been going on. Uh, and, and then uh, what I want to show you here is how, the, the, uh, if, if, you don't, if you just want to wait around, if you don't want to do anything with these measurements, I'm going to show you in a minute the APIs to get these measurements if you wanted to do that, but if you didn't want to do that, uh, the, the easiest thing to do is just wait, and what we will do is in include round trip timing measurements into the Google Fuse location provider. So that's this. So this is, a, this is where location comes to you from in the phone. And it, it's an existing thing. It already integrates uh, GPS uh, s location from cell towers, Wi-Fi RSSI, as I've mentioned, and the sensors, accelerometer, gyro, and mag, fuses them together uh, using some kind of well-known filters like Kalman filter, particle filter, and so on, and gives you an output. And as RTT access points proliferate in the ecosystem, we will merge RTT into that. Now, I don't know if I mentioned, as we were talking about RSSI, how, remember I said you have to assume at some point that you know the location of the access point. Well, how do we know the location of the access points for RSSI location that gives us a, an indoor location in the first place? The way we know is that when, when somebody is using their phone and they've enabled and uh, they've opted in for location, for, uh, for location and for uh, sharing the information with us, then, then we will sample some of the data from some phones. So we'll, get, we'll crowdsource data and we do a SLAM process like robotics, simultaneous location and mapping. And so we simultaneously uh, locate the trace that we got from that phone and locate the access points. And if you've got a bunch of traces, there's clearly a relationship to where the access points were and where those traces are, and it's a circular relationship. If you, if you know where the access point are, you can locate the trace, but you don't know where the trace is, and that's what SLAM is all about, for simultaneously locating this stuff given a bunch of traces. So that's what we do, and so for that to work with RTT, we need there to be quite a lot of access points. And uh, one of the interesting things to tie into Vinko's talk from two weeks ago was that he was talking about 802.11az, which uh, is, it will be that, there will be a lot of, impetus, a lot of motivation for people to, to upgrade the access points for security reasons. And MC is an earlier sense, so it's going to ride along. So as people, because a lot of people wouldn't bother up, updating an access point just for RTT, but they will update it because they want extra security. And so MC is going to ride along. And so we expect to see far more access points being RTT capable. I have one, one question on this uh, slide. Yeah. Right, so yeah, so the, uh, the question, Nambi's question is, uh, can I give you some feel for what kind of accuracy improvement you get from, from the fused data? Uh, and... Yeah, an individual on, like, Wi-Fi or, yeah, or yeah, so, yeah. so, it, it, so the, the answer depends very much on your environment. Uh, so if you're out in the open, the, at the moment you get the five meter accuracy from GPS, and so you'll, you'll get that anyway. Uh, and so... Let's talk about urban planning, like San Francisco. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so now the benefit comes when, you, when, you, or when you're in a, some, I think a better example maybe is when you walk outside to indoors. Okay. Yeah, from, go from outside to inside. I'm sure you've all, you've all noticed if GPS works when you're inside, it works really badly. And the reason is you lose the direct signal and you start to pick up signals reflected from the building across the street. So if you just go with GPS, the position will tend to want to jump as you go inside and then become not available at all from GPS and then you'll get a position from Wi-Fi. So you get a lot of jumpiness uh, without the fuse location provider. And so it eliminates that jumpiness. So you get to that kind of accuracy that I showed you uh, on that, that blue bubble chart, which is you know, 10 to 15 meter accuracy, but more consistently. And then by integrating the sensors, that gives you 
relative accuracy. So as you walk around, so in the latest release of the fuse location provider, uh, you'll, you'll know you've got it when if you walk, uh, so it's an experiment you can do. If you walk around now and look at Google Maps when you're indoors, probably on your phones, you'll see an update every, about every five seconds, and that's because it's doing the Wi-Fi scans. But on my phone, because I've got the latest thing, which is uh, sl slowly roll out to people once we've done tests to make sure we're not eating your battery and all that kind of stuff, uh, every time I take a step, it'll update. And the reason for that is getting that from the accelerometer and the gyro and the mag. So it's that kind of thing. It eliminates the jumpiness, and by bringing in the, 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 the motion sensors, it can give you a, a much more immediate accuracy. Like you don't just get a position every, every five seconds, for example. The cell, okay, what, so the question is, what is, what is the cell NLP? Uh, so uh, this one of the first uh, indoor location technologies was just get the cell ID, and you can associate your position with the position of the nearest cell. And you, you, I'm sure you've all seen that. You bring up a map, and you'll see a blue dot with a huge circle around it. And you're like, what's that? And well, that's the cell ID. You know, a huge circle, I mean like a kilometer or two kilometers. And so that's mostly what that is. And you think, well, what use is that? Well, at least it gets, you know, if you, like, I flew down uh, from San Francisco, arrive here, when I bring up a map, at least it brings up the right map, for starters, and then it'll take a few seconds before it scans uh, APs or gets the GPS, and so that's really what the cell NLP is doing. R really rough location from cell ID. There was another question there. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to try it now. So yes, the question is, yeah, so suppose it's doing the step counting. Are oh, you riding a bike? It's, it's not mentioned here, but, but hidden in there uh, is activity recognition. And if you go uh, Google the uh, Android Activity Recognition API, you'll see that we have, so part of, so the location group in which I work, uh, if you think of it as the second derivative of location, first derivative is course velocity, I kind of think of second derivative is activity. It's like acceleration. It's like, what are you doing? And we have, uh, so inside of Android, uh, we have a bunch of machine learning algorithms that are running on, mostly on the accelerometer and try to figure out what you're doing to, to make the location work better. And so, uh, so ideally, it would know if you're walking or cycling. So cycling and walking are two different activities that are worked out. And you can query that through the activity recognition API. And internally, we use that. So the answer to your question is, if we know you're cycling, uh, then we can't update every step. And it'll update every five seconds when you're indoors. And if we don't know you're cycling, we think we're walking, then it'll probably update on every pedal or something, because it'll spoof it and think it's a step. But I'll, I'm going to test it now and <laughs> see. OK. Uh, all right. So uh, that's, that's just to show you how things, this got a little, what's coming in the future. And now I want to kind of talk about, well, OK, suppose we don't want to wait for the future, because we're engineers. We want to make, we, in fact, if you're engineers, it's manifest destiny that you cannot wait for the future. You, you have to make the future. I mean, someone's going to make it. So you want to try RTT for yourself. So I'm going to walk you through the Android APIs that have been released in Android P to show you how you add uh, RTT feature to an application. OK. So, uh, first of all, remember, it's round trip time, so you need the phone and, an access, and several access points to be uh, RTT enabled and to support the 802.11mc protocol. By, by the way, on the slides, because uh, I notice you're photographing, which is fine, uh, but uh, we are going to, I'm going to show you code snippets here right, right now. And uh, so what I discussed with Nambi is I'll make a PDF of the slides available so they'll be there as a link along with the video so that you can go and look at it later. So, so these, the PDF of these slides will be available to you, the, the students, uh, here. Okay, uh, so, uh, so you, you, you need, so uh, to, to get the RTT measurements from the phone, you need to, there's a, a thing called access find location permission, so you need to have that permission enabled, which means for an app, uh, you have to pop up a request to someone and tell them you want that and they have to give you permission. Uh, and then, of course, location has to be on and Wi-Fi scan must be enabled. So those are uh, requirements before the phone, before Android will give you the RTT measurements. And, and so now 
these little code snippets are to answer the question, well, how do you do that? How do you know whether your phone supports RTT? So in P, we've added a feature called uh, Feature Wi-Fi RTT. Uh, so that's there. And so you can check uh, whether that feature uh, returns true. So you just, you know, you, you do that method, has system feature, RTT, you get true or false. Uh, for example, all Pixel phones, so all Google phones that are running P support this feature. And for other phones, you just have to do the query and see if, if they do support it. Okay, now how do you know uh, whether the access point supports RTT? So you do a Wi-Fi scan as normal, and you get the scan results and pack them uh, into some list like this. So you get the scan results, and, and then you can, uh, there's this... Uh, Thing you can check is 802.11mc responder true. So if this returns true, the access point supports round trip timing, and if it's false, it does not. So you make a list, so you do a scan, you see which access points around you, you make a list of the access points that support RTT. And then after you've done that, then you can begin ranging. So that's done uh, with the Wi Fi RTT manager mentioned there, and uh, you you use a system service Wi-Fi RTT ranging service. So that's a new system service that's provided with P. And then you can start uh, RTT ranging and you send a ranging request and the result is set up to come back to this callback in RTT manager and it will have these fields. Uh, so it'll give you the MAC address and it'll give you the distance. Okay. And the status will tell you if it, if it succeeded or failed. So what you're looking for is if you succeeded, what was the MAC address of that access point? And you're gonna, if, if you've got a database of where those access points are, that's how you tell who's who, and then you, you get the distance. Okay, and then the distance is going to have several things. It's going to give you mean distance and standard deviation and et cetera. And what et cetera is, so here's a list of the fields that you get with the RTT ranging results. So... Uh, it, it'll give you distance. It'll also give you distance standard deviation over there. And we saw how it gets that by making uh, many uh, ping pongs and looking at the variance of those. And then you can also see the number of attempted measurements, which, like I said, will typically be eight in Android, and the number of successful ones. And that'll give you idea uh, idea of the variability of the channel. And so access points that you're close to and you have clear line of sight to will tend to be eight out of eight, and poorer ones will, will have a lower success rate. And then, of course, you also get the RSSI. So you can, you can also, that's actually an independent measurement from the RTT, so you can also use that. So that, those are the actual measurements you can get, and then you can actually do uh, positioning yourself. And now, you, uh, so, you, so who would want to do this? Well, if, if you or a customer of yours or a partner of yours actually owns a venue, so think about it, uh, if you, you are working for uh, like Target, or something, and they, they own the venues, they can go and upgrade the access points, often it's just a firmware upgrade, to make them RTT capable, and they can map them themselves, and so you could do this per venue today, right? And if you want to do it worldwide with crowdsourcing, well then you have to wait uh, for the, the infrastructure to scale, but that, that's what I meant when I said at the beginning, that you can, you can get a head start on this for specific applications, and, and meaning venue by venue applications. Okay, and then, so what devices support RTT? Well, I mentioned that, that all Pixel phones do uh, with Android P and Google Wi-Fi, that's a Google Wi-Fi access point in the top right. By the end of this year, off-the-shelf Google Wi-Fi devices will already be RTT capable and, if you, and any ones you've bought before the end of the year will get a push update on the firmware. So all Google Wi-Fi access points will be RTT capable. So if you want to do experiments in the lab, that's what you should use, that's what we use ourselves. Okay, and globally, we're seeing deployments. So from, from crowdsource scans, we can see if something is RTT capable. South Korea, interestingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, uh, with Samsung and LG and so on, uh, has the most, that's a heat map to give you an idea uh, of the deployment of RTT access points. Uh, and we, we're seeing fairly limited number worldwide so far, but very rapid growth uh, in, in the proliferation of RTT capable access points. Okay, so that's, that's all I was going to say about the details of indoor location, and so now it's time to talk about GPS. So let's move on outdoors and talk about how you get one meter GPS accuracy, and what I'm going to show you uh, is limited to one meter accuracy in the open sky, in an open area, not, not 
in a, in a city where there's a whole effect of the buildings, which we won't talk about today. So to, to explain this, I'll show you some of the basics of GPS, just enough to, for you to understand what's new in the satellites recently and what's new in the phones and how you can exploit these new things to cre create better uh, GPS accuracy than the standard accuracy you get from phones. Okay, so let me uh, explain the basics of GPS. So, th so the satellites send an encoded signal. You can see this, this means data bits. That's why I send a square wave there. Uh, and what those data bits are doing is telling you the time that they were sent from the satellite. So there's bits being sent from the satellites basically to tell you this is the time. And of course, it takes a while to send the data bit, so what they're telling you is the time of one reference data bit edge. And then you receive that signal, and you look at the time that you received it, and the delay tells you uh, how far away the satellite is. So the way to think about it is kind of like you have a tape measure. So uh, Nambi provided a tape measure here as a prop. So imagine that you have this tape measure, and this end is attached to the satellite. Okay, so it goes up to the satellite. You're holding the spool, and if, if you look down, you would see a number, the number is, is telling you how far away the satellite is, and it just comes about from the difference in your clock and the satellite's clock. And you can move away, the number gets bigger, you move closer, the number gets smaller, and that's basically how GPS works. And there's no round-trip time like Wi-Fi, and the reason you can do this is that the satellites themselves are all synchronized very accurately with each other. The only thing that's not synchronized is your local clock, and that's so you've only got one unknown for clock, and you solve for that as part of the regular uh, GPS solution. But the thing to imagine here is that you, you have this tape measure going up to the satellite and it's got tick marks on it. And the important thing is that those tick marks can only appear wherever there's a data bit. And the data bits occur at uh, one microsecond rate. All the, all these, that, uh, they're actually spreading code bits. So you're a communications uh, expert, so you understand this. There's a, a, a PRN code, pseudo-random noise code, that does, it's a, it's a CDMA system a good place to be talking about CDMA here in San Diego. So it's a CDMA-based system. There's a spreading code, and the chips on that spreading code are one microsecond long, and therefore they are about 300 meters long. Microsecond times the speed of light is 300 meters. So this is like, think of a really long tape measure where you've got tick marks on it. The tick marks are labeled, but they only occur every 300 meters. So it's like a really coarse tape measure. And that's your GPS in your phone. And the, the receiver is going to correlate on that code, square wave correlate and square wave gives you a triangle. It's going to figure out where the peak of that triangle is. It's going to interpolate between these 300 meters, and it's going to get about 5 meter accuracy. And there you go. That's the 5 meter that I mentioned early on. And that's the state of the art of GPS in phones. But you might be thinking to yourself, but wait, how does a square wave get sent through space in, in the first place? Well, you all know it's modulating, it's modulating a carrier wave with GPS. GPS all was designed in the 70s, so it's actually really old. Uh, and so it's, it's very simple stuff. It's great. Yeah, it's just really easy to understand, that's why I like it. It's, okay, so it's the simplest modulation. It's just BPSK modulation, binary phase shift key modulation of a sine wave. So let's put the sine wave there. So now you've got the sine wave, and the, it's one and a half gigahertz. So the wavelength, something like 20 centimeters of GPS. And so that's, that's really fine. And then your GPS receiver can measure the phase of where you are. You've got a, a phase lock loop in the receiver. and can measure where you are in a particular wavelength. So now you're measuring relative position or relative movement, you could, as you, if you track that wavelength continually and you move 10 centimeters, you can measure that. So now this is a different tape measure. This is like a really finely graduated tape measure with no numbers at, at all, because the, the carrier wave has no information on it. So you could measure your phase and maybe you'd measure 90 degrees. You could say, well, I know I'm exactly there, exactly, to like a centimeter accuracy, and you can do that with GPS. But maybe I'm there, right? And maybe I'm on the next one. You've got, you got the phase information, but no distance information. So what do you do with that? Well, this is actually this part. Like, what do you do with that is one of the oldest things in GPS. The first commercial application of GPS was to surveying, because the surveyors could afford to pay the thousands of dollars for the big box. And that's why we got our surveyor in this picture, because I went and got some old clip art from uh, my friend there, uh, Pratap Misra, who wrote a book in 1998. So there's a picture of a surveyor. He's carrying a GPS antenna on a stick. And it's got a radio in his backpack. And why? why? Because the way you disambiguate this carrier phase, you get information from a reference station. So what is a GPS reference station? It's just a GPS receiver at a known site that's measuring the same thing at the same time and communicating it to you somehow, either by radio or you get it off the internet after the fact. By combining those measurements in some well-known ways, you can disambiguate this carrier phase after measuring for a minute or so. Okay, so 
you can get centimeter accuracy from carrier wave, and you could actually do that in phones today. So, so what's new? Well, what's new is that this carrier wave is available as a measurement from the Android API, and it was never available from phones before. It was available from these kind of receivers. You could buy a survey receivers. You could buy for $10,000, but it wasn't available for phones. So it is available from phones now. And more importantly, almost, or as importantly, is that dual frequency GPS is coming to phones. So every phone in this room right now has a GPS receiver on it, and they're all single frequency GPS. They all operate on the L1 band, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, 15, uh, one and a half gigahertz, about 1575 megahertz for GPS. So that's the L1 band. And there's a new frequency in town called L5. And uh, L5 is supported on some new chips, in particular one from our number and my old company, Broadcom, and some several other companies, I'll mention them in a minute, uh, have dual frequency chips that can go into phones and are going into phones. Okay, so why is dual frequency important for high accuracy? The reason is you can disambiguate this carrier phase ambiguity much faster, and I'm going to show you briefly why. So imagine you've measured 90 degrees on the L1 carrier phase. Well, you're at the green dot or the red dot or maybe the next one over. But imagine now on a different frequency, you measure phase, and just for argument's sake, let's suppose you measured 90 degrees on that different frequency wave as well. Well, instantly, you know that you must be, if, you, if your choice was green or red and you, on, on the green wave, and you measured 90 degrees on a, on a red sine wave, well, you could not be at this red one because that one's not 90 degrees. So you can, you can see how you can disambiguate really fast with dual frequency, where you could, which would be very slow using the, the standard uh, packages that you have for, for single frequency. So that's the benefit of the dual frequency to high accuracy GPS. And L5 is supported on all these different GNSS systems. So GPS, we often say GPS when generically, kind of like we say Hoover or Kleenex. Uh, but technically speaking, GPS is the American system. Uh, Galileo is the European system. Beidou, the Chinese, QZSS, Japan, IRNSS from India. So all of these countries have put up satellites for us to use. And all of those uh, support the L5 uh, signal. So there are just recently a lot of L5 signals from space. There's L5 chips coming into phones. Why I said in the very beginning, it's a very exciting time for location, because a few years ago there wasn't this. So we've kind of simultaneously got high accuracy coming to Wi-Fi, high accuracy coming to GPS by coincidence at the same time. Okay, just there's some examples of some press releases uh, uh, from companies, Broadcom, Ublox, ST Micro, and more lately that have made these chips, uh, and you can see the example of the size there, 2.6 two by, by 4 millimeters. That's the size of a GPS chip in a cell phone uh, supporting dual frequency. Okay. Now, so how do you get access to these measurements if you want to go play with it? Uh, so, again, the device itself must support the GNSS measurements API. If you, if you want to see, if, you, if you're into GPS and you want to see which devices support raw measurements. Uh, we maintain a site. Uh, you can just Google raw measurements, but you can also, it's g.co slash GNSS tools. Uh, maybe I'll add it to the slide if I remember. Or, uh, the, uh, and uh, so your device must support the APIs. And then again, just like Wi-Fi, you need the access find time, find, access find location permission from the user and location must be on. So very, exactly the same as uh, RTT. Uh, oh, okay, there it is. So I forgot I had it on the slide. So right up there, uh, that, that site, there is a table, just a regular text table that has a list of the phones that we're aware of that already support this API. And over time, every single new phone should support it if they have the appropriate hardware. And it basically means all new high-end Android phones support this. And if you've got a, uh, and, and in even not so much high-end, there's a, a Nokia phone just came out that you can get for around $400 that supports this measurement. And some of the, the, the if you get some very low-end phones, they have, they'll, they'll go with like older version of, of chips that might not support this. But look at that, if you, if you want to do experiments, go look at that table, but you pretty much guarantee that any new Nokia, Huawei, Pixel, uh, uh, Samsung, Android phone supports these measurements. Uh, so, okay, so that's how you do it as a human being. How do you, use, uh, you know, just go read? How do you do it programmatically? Uh, well, you, you go uh, look at this method uh, on status changed, and it'll tell you if measurements are supported. If they're not supported, this, will be, this bit will be set. Uh, you, 
Location must be enabled, as I mentioned, so that needs to be false. So, right, this will be false, this needs to be false, this needs to be false, and status ready needs to be true, it means location is on. So if you've got that response uh, from that query, then you're good to go. And when you get these measurements, th these, there's, there's a lot of information that comes, so I've just pulled out some of the ones that are relevant. There's which constellation are you listening to of those many different GNSS constellations. So you get, you, you, you can uh, exercise these per measurement that you get. So you'll say which constellation type, which carrier frequency, so you can tell if you're L1 or L5, and then, very importantly, this accumulated delta range in meters, that's how the chip communicates to you how far it is along the particular carrier wave. So what it is is the, the change in distance since it began tracking that wave. So it's a relative distance, which is kind of what I explained in the first place, because it's, it's just a carrier wave. So those are the key measurements that you get. And then really important is this notion of duty cycling. So I should explain that briefly. What do I mean by duty cycling? Uh, if you, when you're navigating with your phone, if you're driving in your car, you'll see the GPS dot update every second because the GPS receivers all operate at one hertz uh, in phones. And you, you think that your GPS is on all the time. It's actually not, it's duty cycling. It'll be on for some fraction of a second and off for most of the second, a large fraction of the second will be off and so on to save power. But to do anything with the carrier phase because you're just measuring change in phase, you have to continually, continuously track that carrier phase. So you have to disable the duty cycling. Well, how do you do that? Well, we've created a developer option in Android P to enable you to do that exactly. Uh, and we've also uh, got an, an app that allows you to log the measurements. So if you want to do anything like that, the first thing to do is to go get this app called GNSS Logger. Uh, you, you can get it. It's, it's not on the Play Store. It's an APK that you can get from that website that I mentioned. And then uh, all of the code for our app, that, that, so our app logs these measurements, and so you can just copy our code. The code is uh, available on GitHub, so it's open source code. So please do that, don't, you know, don't have to do it from scratch, just copy our code, you'll find this, that's where this code is coming from, you'll find this code. And I'll briefly go through some things, not too much detail, but that it's there for you later to go look at, okay, what do I need to get the measurement? So first of all, there's this on status change, which I told you about a couple of slides ago, and then, uh, you, you set up a callback, you get this measurements event, and that returns the measurements. And so, and then these measurements we talked about, constellation type, carrier frequency, accumulated delta range in meters. And then this uh, slide is to show you how you exercise this developer option to disable duty cycling. So at the moment, this is a developer option because this is not, so carrier phase measurements is still kind of something at the, at the development stage. And obviously when you, when you force full GPS measurements, there's a power trade-off. So we don't want just anybody making app, putting this in the apps to programmatically disable duty cycling because your battery life will go down and everyone will hate us. So what we need is for people who are developers, you can go to the developer uh, page and just slide that switch, force full GPS measurements, GNSS measurements, you'll get continuous carrier phase then from the phone without any duty cycling. And once people have apps that, that are useful to people and there's a clear benefit to the increase in battery life, then this will become programmatic uh, in some future release of Android and it can be part of the app so you, didn't, you wouldn't have to go slide a button. Okay, so now uh, some people are not waiting for the dual frequency phones to become available. So they, they are available, by the way, uh, Xiaomi, uh, has a phone and I think uh, Huawei has already released a dual frequency phone. So there are dual frequency phones available, uh, but you can do some location with single frequency carrier phase. It's just slower, as I mentioned. And uh, on the left is a block diagram of, of how you would do this. You get the measurements from the GNS chip through the hardware abstraction layer, and then you'd have your app here and some kind of positioning library PPP here stands for precise point positioning. It's industry standard term for what we're doing, getting the information, or what you would be doing, getting it from some reference station. And uh, so an example of people doing this, this is the, uh, this is uh, CNES, the French uh, space agency, people who put up the Galileo satellites. They, they made this app that does this. And uh, this is my phone, this is my test bench, haha. Uh, and you, that's where you can see where the phone is actually, and that's the position 
uh, coming out of this app, and you can see it's good to 0.94 meters. This is the reported accuracy, and from the from the where the blue dot is and the scale of this thing, you can see it's actually correct. It really is good. So it converged to submeter accuracy, but it took it a few mi minutes to do so. The phone just sitting there because you've got the single frequency, and you need the dual frequency to do that fast. If you want to do this kind of thing yourself, uh, there's publicly available reference networks. Uh, Here's one, IGS.org, and there's publicly available libraries. There's open source libraries for doing this PPP positioning, and there's one called RTK Lib. These are kind of the two most well-knowns. So if you want to do this kind of thing yourself, there's also, I suggest you start there. There's commercial reference networks for doing this. You have to pay money, but start with the free ones and maybe all you need. Okay. Uh, this is just another example of what people have already done uh, using these chips that I told you about and using the Android API. So this is... Uh, showing convert this is uh, convergence of accuracy on a cell phone over a period of a few minutes and it begins at m meter level accuracy and then keeps on converging as long as you keep on tracking down to decimeter accuracy so that was a phone and then this is another paper that someone did uh, do looking at uh, an implementation of those chips i mentioned one of those chips the uh, st microelectronics chip in a car so in a car, typically, you have a much better antenna for your GPS than you have for a phone. And so you'll see the, the nominal accuracy is around about a meter, which is better than the five meters in the phone. But then this, this, this carrier phase process accuracy is also uh, significantly, you know, uh, proportionally better. And you're down at about 10 to 20 centimeters. So you're within that carrier wave distance of accuracy. So that's the kind of thing you can do with these tiny little chips. And you can see why I'm excited about this. Okay, so just to summarize, what all of that for the GPS, what, will, what would you need? Well, will you need uh, the device location has to be enabled and your app has to have got permission uh, from the user. And so location, and uh, so all of that's been available since Android N, the capability to get the measurements and to get location permission. Uh, so you get the measurements themselves, which are coming off that uh, code, that, in, that uh, PRN code from the satellite, that's been available since Android N. Uh, the, you want continuous carrier phase, that's available in Android P. Ideally, you want dual frequency, which is, I said, coming soon, but it's actually in some phones already and cars. And then you'd need a reference network, and there's an example, you get it from IGS.org, and then you'd need some processing software, which is up to you. So this is something Google is not, like I mentioned with the Wi-Fi, we'll make it part of the FLP as a natural evolution of our fuse location provider. This, because this requires some third-party uh, uh, data from a GPS reference network, that's something that we're not doing, and, and, but, other pe but we're making the measurements available so other people can do it if they want to, and indeed they are doing it as, as you saw in my one example. Okay, so that's the end of the GPS, and so now let's go back and tie these all together. So uh, I've summarized it like this, that we've got two different technologies that coincidentally give you submeter accuracy right around now. If, and, and so the first column here gives you what the technology is. The next column is what Android P gives you to access the technology, what else do you need, and what you can achieve. So, so to review uh, with, with Wi-Fi, uh, the technology is Wi-Fi RTT and RTT enabled access points. So both of those things are available now. Android P gives you the public API to get those RTT measurements. You do need something else. You need access point infrastructure, meaning these access points need to be there, and somehow you need to know the location of them. Either someone could manually enter it or you could learn it somehow. Uh, so, uh, so reverse localization. Uh, I know like Dinesh is working on that kind of thing. You could learn where these access point locations are. Somehow or other, you need to figure out the access point infrastructure, and then what can you get? You can get a one meter accuracy indoors, like I showed you in the little demo uh, about 40 minutes ago. Okay, and then in the long run, the Fuse Location Provider will integrate RTT once the RTT ecosystem scales up. Okay, now GPS in Open Sky, very analogous. You've got a new, you've got new technology, which is dual frequency GPS in cell phones and availability of continuous carrier phase from cell phones. Android P gives you public measurement API and this developer option to disable the, uh, the duty cycling and therefore to enable measurement of continuous carrier phase you need something else, you need reference station access, and you can get submeter accuracy in open sky, as I demonstrated with those apps and the, the data. So final thing, if you do get involved in building apps, there's some things that you really must pay attention to. You, you're gonna have to get permission from users of your app to, 
to access location information. So you really need them to trust you. And how do you, how do you get that? Well, you must provide transparency and control, meaning you should explain to them what, what you're getting from them. You'll be getting measurements so that they can get more accurate locations. So you say that in clear terms. We want measurements so you can get more accurate location in this app. And then the, tr and the control is, if they want to switch it off, they can, you, you can, ex so it's really useful if you can, when you ask for permission to say, you can switch this off at any time. And you maybe give a little summary of how to do that. You know, go to settings, disable. Uh, so that's really important. Another thing to mention is that in both of these things, if you're doing RTT with Wi-Fi or you're doing carrier phase with GPS, it's going to fail at some stage. You're going to move away from somewhere where you had RTT access points or you're going to, this, the GPS signal will be blocked by a, a building or something like that and you'll lose that continuous track. And you should fail gracefully and you can fail gracefully because there is this fused location provider that's doing its best job all the time. So you might be getting very high accuracy, but if you lose it, don't just give nothing. You can go, just go and pipe through the fuse location position, for example, or, or, or filter it so that your position gracefully changes from the most recent one to what the FLP does so the user doesn't get a jump and people hate jumps. As long as if you give the wrong position but you kind of slowly move to the wrong position, they, someone observing the map or something can kind of figure that out. So, so you should always recover gracefully. Don't, you, you sh not only should you not assume that your app's going to work all the time, you, you can you can guarantee that this kind of high accuracy thing is, is not going to work all the time because you're dealing with very precise measurements that it will get blocked sooner or later and, and you'll lose them and you have to recover. And then finally, battery life. As I mentioned, uh, you, with the GPS, you're disabling to make this work. You're disabling duty cycling. With Wi-Fi, you're doing scans. So in either case, you're, you're using up more of the user's battery, so you've got to be aware of that and you know, only do as much as you, you need to do. Present the users, you know, ex clearly explain. The more you do all this stuff, the better your app the more people are going to like it. Okay. And, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I've got for you today, and I, I hope we've got uh, time for questions. Thank you. So, yeah. Dinesh. In 600 seconds, you were able to get to down to 10 centimeters using... Uh, yeah, the PPP. GPS stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, but let's say if you go to dual frequency, how much time this would reduce to? Okay, right. So just to repeat the question, if you didn't hear, so you saw in the results there, uh, this is from some of these uh, papers, that people could converge to, to decimeter accuracy in, a, in about 600 seconds, 10 minutes. Uh, and the question is, if you have dual frequency, how fast can it be? Well, it can be almost instantaneous. It can be a matter of seconds uh, if you have enough carrier phase measurements from enough satellites. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And 10 centimeter is what the industry defined standard right now is for the entire V2X and what they want to do for the outdoor localization. Yeah. You get right track merging and so on and so forth. Right. So the 600 seconds, you shouldn't view that in any way as as anyone suggesting that that's useful to anybody. It's it's more that it's showing what's possible. So these are some of the first academic papers to come out of people saying, okay, I'll take these measurements, see what I can do. And the first thing is kind of existence proof. Can you get really high accuracy out of a phone? It's like, yes, we can. And now what people are doing is working on these the dual frequency measurements and see how fast. So the limitation they're going to run into next, I mentioned, so you could get instantaneous, almost instantaneous uh, accuracy down at the decimeter level. The next limitation is the quality of the antenna. And in a phone, the quality of the antenna of the GPS antenna is very poor. Uh, it's, it's a really tiny antenna. The wavelength I already mentioned is almost 20 centimeters. Uh, the antenna is much less than a quarter wavelength, so it really is not a proper antenna. Plus, there's other things around there that are detuning the antenna, particularly cameras. And the cameras that keep adding more and more cameras, for obvious reasons. That's, you know, one of the most, the most useful features of the phone. So antennas in phones are very bad, and that'll be the next issue you run into, that the phase center of the antenna is different from different directions. As you move the phone, it's, it's going to limit it, the accuracy. And so that surveyor that I showed in that little stick figure, he, was, he had an antenna this big on a stick. And if you, if you keep your eyes open when you see people doing surveys out in the street, you'll sometimes notice these frisbees on top. Like, raise your hand if you've ever seen that. Like a little frisbee, yeah, a little frisbee on top of a tripod or on top of a stick. That's a GPS antenna. It costs about $4,000 just the antenna, right? So it's much, much, it's got a very stable face in uh, it's, they, they, you know, it's, it's properly tuned. Uh, there's nothing around, it's, it's big like this because uh, 
it's got a ground plane to reject all the ground level MoliPath. So that's the next. So so you're not going to get so practically in a phone you're going to get what what people I expect people will show next is you'll see papers coming out in the next year where people said I took this phone and I wired the antenna to a survey grade antenna and I showed uh, decimeter accuracy instantaneously. And then, they'll, and then they'll say, and then I took away that antenna and used the in-phone antenna, and then you'll see another convergence. And it'll be somewhere between a couple of seconds, it'll be much less than 600 seconds, and we don't know yet where it's going to be. That's, that's the research going on right now. Just a final question. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of buzz about GPS-3. 3.2, yeah. I don't understand that much, right? Can you comment what is exactly GPS-3? Okay, yeah, so question here, what, what is GPS-3? So uh, GPS, as I mentioned, was designed in the 70s, and then they started launching satellites at the end of that, and, the, 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 uh, and once they had a full constellation, they started launching the next generation of satellites, and that's what we have right now. We have, we're in GPS-2, and uh, they've got an, a full constellation of GPS-2 now, and they've, they're starting the next generation of satellites called GPS-3, and the first one will be launched... Uh, later this year or next year. Uh, nice trivia thing, it's going to be launched on the SpaceX satellite for the first time. It'll be the first time SpaceX has launched a, a GPS satellite, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just the evolution of the GPS system. It'll have some newer signals. Uh, the, it'll have a, a different uh, signal on an L1 that uh, contains, it's a, that's, that's, remember I talked about that plus or minus 300 meters, they'll have a signal uh, on L1 that's, that's uh, Bach encoded because since the 70s we've learned some things better than BPSK so there's Bach binary offset carrier modulation so they have a, a signal on L1 that'll have that uh, it, it'll, su it'll support the legacy system so it'll support the BPSK on L1 that you have now and, and uh, it'll support L5 as well uh, the last 12 GPS satellites have had L5 and so every new GPS satellite will have L5 so, okay, so in summary, so what's the buzz about GPS-3? It'll have a new signal on L1 that's not that useful because one of the problems with GPS is the satellites are very well made. So you think, why is that a problem? Well, they, they last for about 20 years. So when you've got a full constellation up there, they, they tend not to launch a new one until one of the old ones dies because they're valuable things. So there's no point just, you know, shooting them off into the satellite graveyard for nothing. Uh, so it'll take many years before GPS-3 replaces GPS-2. And so for, for the next 10 years, GPS-3 will just be a fraction of the GPS constellation. So the thing you really care about is that with each new GPS satellite, there'll be another one of these L5 signals in space. That's the, the short answer. <laughs> so let's recap. What's so good about GPS-3? It's going to add another L5 capable satellite each time they launch one. Yeah, there was a question over there, I think. Right. Right. Well, okay. So the question is, uh, do all the do all the satellites use the same standard? So in the RF domain, the answer is in general no. They each publish their own interface control document, and the people who make the GPS chips have to kind of redo a design every single time depending on how different the standards are. So QZSS, the Japanese system, does use the GPS standard. So, it, so QZSS and GPS use the same standard. Beidou is quite similar to GPS. GLONASS is completely different. And I was at a, a meeting in Stanford with like, so all the old GPS guys uh, who developed GPS. They've got a strong association with, with Stanford, and we had a, a symposium in afterwards. It was like it was kind of like this, but we were done with the presentations, and they were sitting there. And it was one of the guys who developed the Russian system was was sitting there. And so these guys are getting to talk to each other, and they'd been working on this thing in the 70s, right? And and through to now, and so off mic they were chatting, and they said, "Yeah, why why did you do this? Why did you do that?" And the guy said, "You know, we really wanted to do it like you, but the political pressure was so good. any engineer." who did it like the Americans, would not be on that program anymore. <laughs> so GLONASS and GPS are very different. It's a real pain for the GPS developers. From your point of view, if you want to use, if you, so if you're building those chips, you have to pay attention to that. And you'll love QZSS and you'll love Beidou and you'll hate GLONASS. <laughs> and so you, you have to do all this work. But 
if you're not building the chips, if you're accessing the chips through Android, it's all, as I showed you, it's all standardized API. And the only difference in the, because, because the, uh, you, you're just getting measurements uh, out of there and it's, it's a time-based measurement. And so it's, it's all standardized at the, at the Android level. So you, you don't have to, you, you, you don't have to worry about the measurement standards for that. In terms of the, when you get down to this processing, uh, different satellite systems provide their satellite orbits in different ways. Everyone provides Keplerian parameters, except the Russians. They provide force models. They use, uh, so you have to do a Runga cutter integration of a force model. And again, it's this, <laughs> it dates back to, they, they, they weren't allowed politically to use Kepler, which is kind of funny. That if you know anything about orbits, that you should always use Keplerian model because that's what describes an orbit. But anyway, uh, if, if, you, if you get down to that level of processing, uh, you, you have to worry about what, what the orbit model describes. But if you just use these standard libraries that I mentioned, it takes care of that for you. So, so one of the things, just to come in, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, you know, folks here missed was your tutorial on use of these models plus relativistic compensation, mm -hmm. you know, which, which, is, which is wonderful. So you want me to? Do you want me to explain that briefly? No, no, you know, some other day. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. If you've, so, what Nambi's referring to, if you ever heard that, you know, GPS is always proving, uh, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity. It's, it's, it's absolutely true, and both of them, by the way, the GPS satellites move fast enough that there's a very measurable effect of special relativity from the speed moving things, moving clocks go slower, time goes slower when you're moving, and they, they're high enough that gravity is significantly less than on Earth, so where gravity is less by theory of general revolution, time goes faster, and both of these things are measurable, and it's not just a little bit measurable, these are huge effects, huge. Like, it's, over the course of a day, the, the satellite clocks would be off by uh, uh, milliseconds, which is, well, uh, many microseconds, whoops, sorry, I'll just, oh well. Just unplug that. <laughs> Many microseconds, uh, which is kilometers, if you didn't take these things into account. So uh, I've, if you go look online, you find all kind of nonsense. And I've seen some people debating this. Oh, is this really true? It's like, not only is this true, this is a huge effect that, if, that everyone who does works in GPS deals with. So it's, it's a really cool and interesting thing. And I better stop there. I could go on and buy relativity and GPS forever. <laughs> Another time. Right, so how do we deal with multipath effects with RTT? The, the answer is no one's really got to that stage yet. It's, it's definitely an issue. Uh, uh, as you, you know, we're at the stage where people are doing experiments where they, they put a lot of access points, like when we did our demo, we had a lot of access points there. So we had line of sight to at least three. Uh, it's not like people don't know about it, but you know, the first, before you worry about what do I do with reflected signals. So, so the real issue is going to be with multipath. If suppose we have an access point out in the hall and we're tracking it here. So that's not just multipath, but this, you, don't, you don't have the direct time of flight signal. If you do have the direct time of flight signal, the, the natural operation of, of, the, of the access point, they're all MIMO now, and they find the direct channel for you with those, you know, like all the access points and multiple antennas. So, so multipath in the sense of that you've got reflections off the walls as well as the direct, that's kind of taken care of by the natural operation of MIMO, that it, it'll find for you the channel that's direct, but what if there is no direct channel and what you're measuring is the signal coming around the corner? Well, right now it's just gonna degrade your accuracy uh, and nobody's done a lot about that next. What will happen is that that's a well-known problem in GPS, like when you're in, a, in, a, in an urban canyon, for example, you get that. And so the techniques that are being used for GPS, so some of them, a lot of them is just uh, exclusion techniques. You, you can work with the measurements and try to figure out which measurements agree with each other and which ones are the outliers and eliminate them. So that's, that will be one of the first approaches. I think with Wi-Fi, there's more chance to do cleverer things because you have both ends of the channel. So you can learn the channel. And, the, and the, there is some research into this area, things like people use, uh, if, you, if, you're getting a, if you have an access point there, but you're not picking up the direct signal, you're picking up a reflection of the wall, you can make a so-called virtual access point of what if that was reflected around the wall and use that. And so that's one of the ways you do that. And, so that's, that's really the answer to your question, is that it's, we're at an early stage of people worrying about that. They, it's, it's probably extremely fair to say if someone has a very, very good solution, Google will be very happy to buy it. Yes, definitely, because yeah, we're, we're, as you see, we're at an early stage, and it's just one of those things, it's, it's not like we, 
it's it's everyone knows it's an issue, but before you start really worrying about that, we've got to just get a lot of RTT working for the line of sight case. So yes, so if you've got good multipath ideas, we are we and everyone in this in industry are interested. So yeah. Okay, right, yes, so dual frequency navigation of UAVs. Uh, I, you know, I, I skipped over at the end, I guess, because was running out of time, is, is applications. I wanted to talk about a few, you know, in the beginning I mentioned applications. Well, uh, at, so I think already with these low cost dual frequency chips, there's companies doing dual frequency for UAVs. I don't, is, I don't know if that's what you meant by your question. Are people doing it or what kind of, that, I mean, it's the one, one of the apps that I could think of that would be very useful, if you have dual frequency in the phone and dual frequency in the UAV, one of the use cases that presents itself is that all UAVs now have a follow me feature, right? So you go snowboarding, your UAV follows you and films you, you get home and you find a film of the person next door to you because your GPS was off by five meters and the UAV is pointing at the wrong person. So be, if you've got high accuracy at both ends of that system, it's going to lead to all kind of cool video capable apps, for, for example. And yeah, and so I know that the, these, some of these chips are going into some UAVs already. And I guess that's all I know about UAVs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so how many APs for accurate results? So you, you, you want at a, a minimum of three to get any result. Two gives you an ambiguous solution, of course, because there's two intersections. Uh, and we found you really, so I think your, your question is more like practical, yes. And so the, the, the answer is really four. Like we found if you, don't, if you want four line of sights, if you've got four line of sight signals, it works well. And fewer than four, notionally you'd have a position, but we found generally it, it works quite badly with fewer than four. So I'd say, so really the answer is four is a practical minimum. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, at the moment, I, I, you have to sequence between them. So you'll spend a few hundred milliseconds on one. And then and, uh, for the RTT, I think, I don't, I don't know if you can do them simultaneously. But I'm not sure. Are you saying you, you can with MC? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, uh, yeah, I think, I think you have to sequence. At, at the moment. So it means you're not getting these rages simultaneously. And so that presents some kind of a challenge, but not too much of a challenge if you have. So from those sensors, you can get the, so one of the things you can do is you can make use of some of the things Google's, Google, I already showed you in the fuse location providers bringing in these sensors. So if you can get the velocity you, you, out of the fuse location provider, then you can, then you have a Kalman filter where you can bring in the measurements. They don't have to be synchronous measurements. You can bring them in one at a time. Yeah, good question. So how how will what? Yeah, I I actually uh, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> We're gonna I haven't I haven't seen the res results of that. Well, what what will happen? Uh, uh, I can think those are all interesting things to given all these APIs available. I think it would be interesting to try them on. Yes. These kinds of use cases. Yes. And the impact of them. Yeah, so actually, yeah, it's a good question. So if, if, you, if you do, like basically we redo our experiment and, and, and have, have uh, Spotify on at the same time, streaming data. So another what, experiment, what will be? Cycling, cycling experiment. That will yes, oh, the cycling, right. Yeah, That's but it's a good, good question. And, and I, I actually don't know the, the answer to that. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So how would you approach on those 
So, so that, yeah, so that question, so yes, how, how, do, you re, how do you get down to sub-meter accuracy when, when you've only, and, and the way that's kind of done at the, at the radio, so this is at the, at the uh, where, where they're doing the correlation on the, on the arrivals. So, so companies like Broadcom and Qualcomm that make these chips, they, uh, they, they do that by, by basically, so I talked about we do several uh, round trip time measurement, but each round trip time measurement is itself made up of many, many measurements that are happening inside the correlator uh, in the hardware uh, of, of the Wi-Fi chip. And so, so uh, that's, uh, and, and even, well, if you just, if you think of, if you've got an 80 megahertz channel, which you do, right, so that gives you, uh, uh, yeah, so that, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's not, that is similar to what I said with the GPS. So you 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 could do a correlation, and you'll you'll get you'll you'll get a correlation result where the the chipping rate, or if you if you like, of of the the way the the signal that you're correlating on, may be much bigger than. So with the GPS case, it's 300 meters, and we get down to five meters uh, as a matter of course. That's that's typical of GPS today. So the same kind of thing. You can interpolate on the correlation result, and that's. That's something that's done in the, the, the implementation of the measurement. When they give those, those T4, T1, T2, and T3, those things are already measured to, uh, or to about nanosecond accuracy, which gets you a submeter. Okay. Uh, yes, thank, uh, uh, thank once more. Oh, thank you.